In this chapter, we will set up our project databases and learn to create migration files for them. So far, we've walked through the main loop of the request response cycle. Browser to the controller, controller to the view, view back to the browser. Over the next few chapters, we're going to shift our focus over to the branch where the model and the database portions are. Now we could start by learning how to create just a model first, one that's not connected to a database, and then we could come back and add in the databases later. But in practice, the two usually go hand in hand, and most of your models will be connected to database tables. Also, in real-world development, the process of creating those model database table pairs usually begins with defining the database. So that's where we're going to start too. I realize some of you may not have extensive experience with databases. So the question comes up, how much SQL should you know? There's two answers. One is that you can get by by just following along with me, stumble your way through a little bit, and make it work. But the second half of the answer is that you absolutely should go and learn it on your own. Rails is going to provide a very friendly layer over SQL so that you don't have to write a lot of SQL, but at the same time, it's going to be helpful to understand what's happening behind that curtain, and every now and then the SQL does still show through, and you are going to need to write a little bit of SQL. There is a special vocabulary associated with databases. Let's walk through a few of the most important terms together. Not only will it make sure that we're all on the same page, but I'll also give you an idea of how these terms fit with the Rails framework. First, we have a database, and that's just simply a set of tables. It's not the same thing as a table. Sometimes people use those words a little bit ambiguously. A database is a collection of database tables. And the way it applies to Rails is that one application typically equals one database. It doesn't have to be true, but at the beginner, most basic level, that's going to be true. We're just going to have one database that we'll be working with. An example name for a database might be simple underscore CMS underscore development. Notice that it's all lowercase with underscores. That's going to be the convention in Rails when we're working with databases, to give them that kind of name. Again, we can configure it if we want something different, but if we're working with Rails conventions, it's going to be all lowercase with underscores. The other thing to remember about databases is that's the level where we're going to grant access permissions. So we're not going to try and have very specific table permissions and let people view some tables and not others. We're going to say, you know what, our Rails application has permission to access this whole database, and then from there, we'll let the application decide whether they ought to be able to get certain information out of the tables. But we will have to grant permission at the database level. Well, if a database is a set of tables, then a table is going to be a set of columns and rows. And in the Rails framework, one model is going to be equal to one table. We can have models that aren't connected to databases, as I mentioned earlier, but typically every model has one corresponding table. And the model and the table both represent a single concept, a noun, the what's of our application. So for example, in the simple CMS that we're going to be building, the nouns might be the users, or the subjects and the pages. Notice that these are also all lowercase with underscores, and they're plural, because it's a table of all of our subjects. So we have many subjects in that table, therefore we pluralize it. Now again, you can customize the table names, but this is the Rails convention. The other important thing about tables is that's where our relationships are going to occur. So there's relationships between our models, there's relationships between our tables. We'll talk more about relationships in just a moment. The next term we have is column, and a column is going to be a set of data of a single, simple type. And the way that works in the Rails framework is that a single attribute of our model is going to be equal to a column. So for example, first name, last name, email, password, those would all be attributes of our user model, and they would all be columns in our table. And the column types, when I say simple type, that's strings, integers, that kind of thing. Now, a table is made up of columns and rows. The rows are actually the data. So each row is equal to an object or an instance. This, in the case of our users, it would be a user. So, for example, we might have Kevin Skoglund, an email address, and a password that then correspond to each of those columns, first name, last name, email, and password. That's what a row in the database will be. And then, of course, we have field, which is the intersection of a column and a row. It has a single value. And an example might be that in the first name field, we have the value Kevin. Now, often, field is just going to be used interchangeably with column. So if you hear me say field instead of column, it's a very common thing that people sort of refer to them as both. Now that we've kind of walked down the hierarchy of a database, the next thing I want to talk about are the foreign keys. It's a very important concept in relational databases. It's a table column whose values reference rows in another table. And that's the foundation of relational databases. An example might be if we had a pages table, we would have a subject ID in that table, 
that would reference the ID of the subject table. Notice that it uses a singular foreign table name. We don't say subjects ID, it's the subject ID, corresponds to our subjects table, and then we put the underscore ID at the end. Again, this is the Rails convention. Because this is such an important concept, I want to give you a diagram to just to make sure it's clear. So let's say we have our subjects table and we have our pages table. Our subjects table might look something like this. We have an ID and a name column, and the row that we're looking at right now is the fifth row, right? ID number five, and the subject is about us. Well, we might have a page row that has an ID of 14. That's its key field. The ID in both places we just call the key or the primary key. And it has its value for name, which is history. Well, this page belongs to the subject about us. So about us, we'll have several pages below it, one of which would be history. So we have a foreign key, subject underscore ID, equal to five. And what we're doing is making a relationship between those two. We can look at the page, see, oh, it has a subject ID of five. Well, now we can go back to the database and we can look up the subject that we want. Or if we have a subject, the subject number five, then we can say, oh, find all the subject's pages, and we can do a search for all of its foreign keys which match. If you've worked with databases before, this is a very familiar concept. If not, you'll get used to it as we continue on. The other terms I want to make sure are clear are index. It's a data structure on a table that's going to increase the lookup speed. It's like the index at the back of a book. It just lets you be able to find things in the database very quickly. And then the schema. The schema is the structural definition of a database. It defines the tables, the columns, and all the indexes, everything that makes up the database. So when I talk about the database schema, that's what I'm referring to. Okay, now that we have some of those fundamental concepts out of the way, let's actually set up our database.